Welcome to worship here at Lake Grove Church, and it is a Sunday of Father's Day and Juneteenth, right? And we're going to be worshiping the Lord today in spirit and in truth as we partner with Christ who transforms the world one life at a time, right? That's what we do here at Lake Grove, and I'm delighted to have you all here. Also want to welcome those of you who are worshiping with us online. You are a part of this worship, just like all of us who are present here. And I hope you'll find a way to register online and let us know you've been with us. Same is true for all of you who have those little notebooks at the center aisle. Let us know you've been with us and pass it on down the row. We appreciate that. How many fathers with us today? Let's express appreciation for all the dads who are here. Yeah. And you may know that you may have seen some goodies out there in the gathering area, and after church today, they're going to have root beer floats. If the rain holds off right out there in the Jesus courtyard, going to be playing games, uh, photo ops. Uh, so uh, we'll be celebrating uh, as families after church. Speaking of fatherhood, the Dashti family, one of our Afghan refugee families that we're sponsoring, they celebrated the birth of their twins this week, a boy, Taib, and a girl, Tahora. We rejoice with their proud papa, Hezbollah, Dashti, and their mother, Arzo. Uh, by the way, this growing family of six needs transportation. Uh, Hezbollah got his driver's license, he's ready to drive, but he's got nothing to drive, and as you know, used cars are very expensive right now, very hard to get, so the church has antied up some money, we're inviting other people to donate as they can, but perhaps in this current market, uh, that where used cars are as, as uh, expensive as, as new cars, perhaps you could keep your eyes and ears open for someone who's trying to get rid of a minivan, or uh, an SUV that will seat at least six, that would be great. Let's do that together and let's see if we can um, help the Dashti family get, get, get wheels for their family. And you can, if you want to, you can donate under refugee assistance. We appreciate that. I'd like you to take a look at that page with the pictures on it. Uh, looks like that. If you have a bulletin, a couple of things there. Um, for those of you who are, and I'll take care of that later. For those of you who are online with us, I'll just describe a couple of events that are happening next weekend. On Saturday, we'll have fun for all ages right here in the church parking lot with mini golf. And uh, they're going to have prizes, uh, they're going to have hot dogs, so you'll be able to kind of have a picnic in the parking lot and play mini golf. We hope you can join us 4 o'clock next Saturday afternoon. Then on Sunday, Again, after church, we're going to be celebrating um, our uh, departing director of children and youth choirs, Marianne Foy. Marianne's going to stay part of the family. She'll continue to sing with us once in a while, but she won't be directing the choirs. If you want to bring cards to express your appreciation for her, that'll be great. And we'll have cake and refreshments in the next hall. Um, finally, today is June 19th. Juneteenth, also known as Freedom Day, because it's a time we celebrate, um, uh, first time we're celebrating as a national holiday, marking the official end of slavery in our nation almost 160 years ago. And in a few moments, we'll be marking this day with a special hymn written by two African American brothers and dubbed 100 years ago by the NAACP as the Black National anthem. I encourage you to play, pay attention to the wonderful words of that song as we sing. But before we do that, I invite the Jacob family forward, led by father and church elder Rene Jacob, although I, he says he's led more by his kids than he leads them, <laughs> um, to lead us in our call to worship. So please stand as we do that together. We join with our sisters and brothers in Christ. We come today praising our great God. We join in praise with voices from around the world. 
let's raise our voices as an act of sincere worship. We praise our God together, lifting our voices. Yes, let's lift every voice and sing. Alleluia, Amen. We do long to be true to you first, grateful for our native land as well, for some of us a chosen land. And we look forward to the day when every voice is lifted in praise and adoration of you in total divine freedom. In the meantime, as the song said, we do not want our feet to stray from the places, our God, where we met thee. Lest our hearts drunk with the wine of the world, we forget thee. We do not want that. No, Lord, we worship you. We thank you for guiding us day by day 
for providing for us day by day, for being our God of hope. And we pray that our worship today is a blessing to you, for we offer it in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. Uh, I wanted to introduce to you Abigail Crossan. I mentioned earlier that uh, Marianne Foy, we're celebrate her, celebrating her service with us as she moves along, but we are delighted that God has blessed us with a seamless transition for our children and youth choirs. Uh, Abby has been singing in church choirs almost since she was born because her dad was a director of church music. Uh, and I know how that is. You've seen my daughters sing in, in this church uh, from when they were really little. Uh, you may recognize her as a guest singer and featured soloist in our sanctuary choir. Abby has a heart for ministry and is excited to lead music with our young choir members this, this fall. Let's welcome her even before she sings.
Do you remember the last time you heard Duke Ellington in church? <laughs> Please look down and see my people through. God is indeed looking down to see us through. Second Chronicles uh, tells us that the eyes of the Lord search the whole earth in order to strengthen those whose hearts are fully committed to him. He is available to us at any time to hear our joys and concerns and also to forgive us. Um, I need forgiveness every day, and I'm glad that the church offers us an opportunity at least once a week, if you're in church once a week. Please join me as we come clean before God together. O Holy One, our Heavenly Father, have mercy on us as we seek your forgiveness. As we think about how we have been unloving this week, as we think about how we have been selfish, and about how we have ignored opportunities to love others and do good. Forgive us, cleanse us, and strengthen us to live in love better than before. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now I invite you please, as you're able to stand for these words of pardon, and I have a verse for you, a strong verse from the little letter, 1 John. The chapter 2 starts like this. My dear children, I'm writing this to you so that you will not sin. But if anyone does sin, we have an advocate who pleads our case before the Father. Father. He is Jesus Christ, the one who is truly righteous. He himself is the sacrifice that atones for our sins, and not only our sins, but the sins of the world. Brothers and sisters, receive and believe the good news that in Jesus Christ we are forgiven and we are made new. Amen? Amen. Let's sing a grateful response. Now, friends, being at peace with God, we can also be at peace with one another with, during these days, a winsome wave, an elegant elbow bump, or a holy kiss without blowing. <laughs> the peace of Christ be with you. Let's share the peace with one another and then remain standing for our hymn.
And now let's continue in prayer. O precious Lord, be our home right now as we lift up our concerns before you in your own name. We are grateful for this day that we can celebrate dads, the men who helped give us existence, and we pray that all fathers and grandfathers will be a positive influence on their children. We know that all familial relationships have some level of dysfunction, and we ask you for your insight and your healing in the lives of those whose fathers are or were not positive factors in their lives. And we're grateful that you are our perfect father, brother, and guiding spirit. So many things to pray about, Lord. Continued war in Ukraine, growing numbers of refugees in our world, flooding, fires, famine, political partisanship and disunity, gun violence, drugs, climate change. Lord, there's so much to worry about, so much brokenness in our world, broken human behavior as well as a broken natural order. Please have mercy on us and give us understanding and give us the will to work to make things better. And we know we need your divine help as we try, Lord. We realize our dependence on you. We thank you for the healthy delivery of Taib and Tahora Dashti this past week. Bless the family as they adjust to the blessing of a baby boy and girl. And while we're at it, Lord, please help us help them to find a family vehicle. And we also pray for those who are hurting in our church family, Lord. Some of us may be hurting just on Father's Day, missing a dad, or sad that we are not connected with our dad. Others of us are hurting due to ills and injuries. Please help with healing and patience. Others struggle with ongoing mental and physical disorders. Please give us strength and perseverance. We are your people. We want to be your people, Lord. And we ask that wherever we are in our unique journeys, that you would equip us to be a part of your saving actions in the world. Equip us to serve you in our respective unique capacities. For we are your loving children. And we join hearts and hands right now to pray as you taught us, saying, Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Well, I haven't had the chance to say it to all of you, so happy Father's Day to those of you. And of course, speaking of, of fathers, it's, it's great. I know you heard about the Doshti twins being born. Isn't that such a perfect thing for Father's Day? I don't know if you, Greg, you told them the, the size, but oh my goodness. So the little boy, uh, well, let's see, Tahora, the little girl, she was six and a half pounds, and the little boy, Tybe, seven and a half pounds. That is a lot of baby. And isn't they healthy and strong? Isn't that so wonderful? So uh, it's just wonderful to see pictures. My wife got to see them in person. Uh, just so wonderful to be celebrating Father's Day today in light of that wonderful gift. Also, as you know, we're celebrating Juneteenth. And uh, we think about, how, you know, the freedom from slavery. And that's wonderful. 
Um, but it also makes us ask, why did God even allow slavery in the first place? You know, we're in this series where we're asking these hard questions of God, hard questions, honest answers, as we're looking at the intersection between Scripture and life. And uh, God actually allows us to wrestle with these difficult questions with Him. God welcomes that. And so in our series, uh, you'll know if you've been with us, you'll know the very first sermon in this series uh, I addressed, well, I should say Scripture really addressed the problem of what we would call moral evil. Why did God create evil? Today, we are taking a look at what theologians call natural evil. Why does God allow natural evil? We're asking that question this way. Why does God allow natural disasters? Why does God allow catastrophes? We thought about it in the, the prayer that, just, that Greg just prayed. He listed a whole series of natural evil. Well, we're going to take a look at this uh, by looking at Genesis. But before we crack open God's word, let's crack open our own hearts and minds to God's will. Let's pray right now. Lord God, we thank you that you are a God who meets us in the hard questions. And as we come before you today with some hard questions, Lord, we know that you will meet us. You will meet us in your scripture by the power of your Holy Spirit. And as we do that, Lord, we pray that you would transform us, transform our hearts, minds, souls, and lives, that we are drawn even closer to you as we wrestle with you and with this question. Thanks for being our God. And we know that you will do that transforming work in our lives because we pray this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. So Genesis chapter 3, verses 9 through 19, this is part of a probably a familiar story to you all. Uh, at this point... The man and woman in the Garden of Eden have eaten the forbidden fruit. And here's what happens next. Genesis 3, verses 9 through 19. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, Where are you? He said, I heard the sound of you in the garden, and I, I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. He said, Who? told you that you were naked. Have you eaten from the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, well, the serpent tricked me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent, because you have done this, Cursed are you among all animals and among all wild creatures. Upon your belly you shall go, and dust you shall eat all the days of your life. I will put enmity between you and the woman and between your offspring and hers. He will strike your head and you will strike his heel. To the woman, he said, I will greatly increase your pangs in childbearing. In pain you shall bring forth children, yet your desire shall be for your husband and he shall rule over you. And, the, and to the man, he said, because you have listened to the voice of your wife and have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. In toil, you shall eat of it all the days of your life. Thorns and thistles it shall bring forth for you, and you shall eat the plants of the field. By the sweat of your face, you shall eat bread until you return to the ground. For out of it, you were taken. You are dust. And to dust you shall return. Friends, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Gulp. Why does God allow natural disasters? Why does God allow catastrophes? Volcanic eruptions, deep freezes, flash floods, earthquakes. Natural disasters caused $280 billion in damages last year alone. Natural catastrophes. When, we, um, when my family and I moved from uh, Spokane to California a few, several years ago, um, our friends were very scared for us because we were moving to earthquake country. Now, we never really experienced a big earthquake, but that's another story. However, 
uh, only four days after we left Spokane, they were hit with a terrible windstorm that knocked over hundreds of trees around the church campus. And a giant tree fell on the sanctuary, crashing through the roof and landing right on the empty seat where I used to sit. Thank goodness I left. They were scared for me, but they ended up with a natural disaster. You know, catastrophes are just part of this world. We can't avoid them. I don't know about you, but it scares me. But if we believe in a caring God, why does God allow catastrophes? When a hurricane tears through a town, leaving demolished homes and mangled bodies. After years of drought, an entire continent becomes a desert as millions die of malnutrition. Maybe you saw yesterday's headlines. We know about the flooding in Yosemite. Well, yesterday's headlines read this. Flooding in India and Bangladesh leaves millions homeless and at least 28 dead. Why does God allow catastrophes? But in Genesis, Genesis 3, it tells us that all of creation fell into disarray because of human sin. Really? I mean, so, so does that mean when I lie, I cause a tsunami? I mean, what kind of a God does that? If God is loving, why is the world full of natural catastrophes? <clears throat> well, there is some humor in our text. As a matter of fact, when we read scripture, there was laughter at that point in our text. As you can see, the humans in our scripture play the blame game. We laugh because it sounds kind of familiar, doesn't it? I mean, the, the man says to God, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit from the tree, and I ate. It's comical. But it's, it's human nature to blame God, isn't it? I mean, we love to do that, especially when it comes to natural disasters. After all, that's why attorneys and insurance companies and society in general call such catastrophes what? An act of God. We legally blame God for natural disasters. We legally blame God for what we call natural evil. At my, uh, at my former church, the one that the tree fell on, one of the elders there, thoughtful, thoughtful man, he taught me this meaningful truth. He said, if you can smile when things go wrong, then you have someone to blame. <laughs> you must have someone to blame. Because after all, it feels better to blame, doesn't it? I mean, it feels better to blame God. But some tragedies, they actually happen because of human negligence. Think about it. If, if a hurricane brings death and destruction, should we ask why God created hurricanes, or should we ask why we build flimsy homes in hurricane-prone areas? When I get sick, do I blame God, or do I confess that I haven't been treating my body right, maybe with a few indulgences or not eating right? Millions of people around the world are hungry and homeless. Should we ask why God allows this, or should we ask why we allow this? Friends, there is more than enough food in the world to feed everyone. And did you know Americans make up 5% of the world's population, and yet we consume over half of its resources? Is famine because God doesn't care or because we don't? Who's really to blame? Yet, in spite of all of that, there are still unavoidable tragedies that 
just don't make sense. There is a dark side to the creation that God had originally called good. So here in our text, what are they saying? Why does our sin mean the fall of creation from goodness? Why does God allow catastrophes? Well, as you can see in our text, God punishes sin. That's right. But look closer. God curses only two things in our text. Did you notice that? God curses the snake. And what else does he curse? God curses the ground. God curses the snake and God curses the ground. God does not curse the man or woman. Look at verse 17. It says this, And to the man God said, Because you have eaten of the tree about which I commanded you, you shall not eat of it. Cursed is the ground because of you. See, the punishment for sin is death. We know that. And yet, in our text, something else happens. Instead of immediate death to humans... God curses the ground, not the man. Why? Well, there is a Hebrew word play going on here. It helps us decode this text. The word in our text for man, or the word for human, same word, the word for human in our text is the word Adam. Can you say that with me? Adam. That's right. Now, later in Genesis, that word actually, as you know, becomes the proper name of the first human whose name is Adam. There we go. Now, there's another word in our text here. The Hebrew word for ground is the word Adam Ah. Adam Ah. Say that word with me. Adam Ah. That's right. Adam Ah. So, one Hebrew letter is added to the end of human, and the word human becomes the word ground. Adam to Adama. You see, decoding this ancient mystical text reveals a profound theological truth. Here's what this text is trying to tell us. You see, God didn't say, cursed are humans, Adam, but cursed is the ground, Adama. One letter difference. Friends, we dodged the curse by one letter. Humanity was supposed to be destroyed. That's the rule. Humanity was supposed to be destroyed, but God would not let that happen. Instead, God deflected the curse that was meant for us, Adam, to hit the ground, Adama, instead. Don't you see what he did? Cursed is the Adama because of Adam. One letter deflects the curse and saves humanity. The curse we deserve hits the earth instead. That's how much God loves us. <laughs> so what's the connection between our sin and natural catastrophe? It's God's saving grace. Later in Scripture, there is an even deeper curse deflection. God deflects our curse of sin from us to fall on himself as the person of Jesus Christ on the cross. God took the curse on himself so that we might live. Do I hear an amen? And so what is the connection between our sin and natural catastrophes, it is God's saving grace. Now, that's the act of God I am talking about. Natural disasters are horrible, but they remind us that God saves us by deflecting our curse from us, landing on the earth. And this grace of deflection is fully expressed in the catastrophe of the cross. The divine catastrophe that saves us by catastrophic grace. That's the real act of God. That's the act that our text is foreshadowing.
A few years ago in uh, Springfield, Virginia, a little eight-year-old boy, Johnny Carlingcheck, uh, saw that a 60-foot tree had fallen on the house of his neighbor, Alyssa Myers. A little act of God there. Johnny's immediate reaction was to empty his piggy bank and hand her the total, five quarters. Johnny wanted to give everything he had to help, even if it was just $1.25. But this little boy wanted to do more. So he set up a lemonade stand on his block with a sign saying, Mrs. Myers Building Fund. And within the first couple of weeks, he raised over a thousand dollars. And people all around were just so impressed that little Johnny ended up in the newspaper. And they interviewed his mother. And she told them that Johnny was particularly sensitive to the needs of others. And he just wants to help. Because, you see, Johnny knew catastrophe all too well. Johnny lost his older sister in a terrible car accident a few years earlier. And Johnny knows, because of God's saving grace, that he'll get to see his sister again. And Johnny knows catastrophe at such a young age. And yet, he shows hope despite tragedy because Little Johnny knows God's catastrophic grace, and he lives it out. Friends, Johnny Carlingcheck is what I would call an act of God. I want to be like Johnny. If you face horrible disaster in your life, personally, horrible catastrophe, nothing can explain it away or make it okay, but... God's grace is stronger than any catastrophe of this world. And he loves you so much that he deflects that curse. In Christ, God takes the full curse for you so that you can live, live like Johnny, in light of another world, in light of a world without the curse, in light of our heavenly home. After all, we are here meeting hard questions with honest answers. And so remember, catastrophes remind us that God deflects our curse so that we can fully live. The curse that we deserve is deflected. God deflects our curse so that we can fully live because the real act of God isn't natural disaster. It's God's saving grace. And so let's live knowing that. Amen. for your many blessings upon us and thank you that you always provide enough that we can also channel tangible resources on to be a part of your saving work in the world thank you for your saving grace and thank you that we get to get to be a part of it please receive our gifts now whether in the plate or by mail or electronic transfer and multiply their impact today we remember in our mission prayer rotation our friends at Beersheba in Senegal. Please bless the community there and Eric as their leader. Locally, we thank you for Timothy Winsley in his 
role as parish nurse for several inner city congregations. Please keep him strong as he seeks to strengthen those churches. Thanks that we can give in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. Please be seated. Let's stand together for the benediction. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, 
and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all as we live knowing God deflects our curse with his amazing grace, both now and forevermore. And all God's people shouted, Amen. Amen.